I first addressed the squad in August. I explained the schedule was very, very difficult. I also explained that we weren't picked very high in the preseason polls, but with good justification. We lost our entire offensive line, all our receivers, including the Heisman Award winner. We couldn't throw the football. We lost our entire defensive line. We lost our last three games of the 1987 season by a substantial margin. But I also felt we had a chance to be a good football team if it started with attitude and if they were willing to work. Attitude, a willingness to work, dedication, spirit, and a little bit of fighting Irish luck. All are critical components in any championship season. It would be no different for the Notre Dame football team during its magical 1988 campaign. The Irish came into August with their fair share of both assets and liabilities. And no one could identify those better than Coach Lou Holtz. Yep, seldom has a team seen more of its question marks emphatically replaced by exclamation points. As Holtz had promised, Notre Dame's defense evolved into a dominant unit. Led by All-Americans Michael Stonebreaker and Wes Pritchett at linebacker, Frank Stams at end, and Chris Zorich at tackle. With a premium placed on improved speed, the Irish ranked third nationally in permitting only 12.3 points per game. Enthusiasm and quickness easily made up for a lack of experience on the neophyte defensive line. Stams turned into a dominant big game player, while Stonebreaker, Pritchett, and Ned Bolkar comprised a linebacking trio few teams could match. The secondary four times held opponents to less than 100 aerial yards. The all-new offensive line, led by All-American tackle Andy Heck, actually paved the way for more rushing yards than the previous year. Notre Dame's rebuilt receiving core boasted a big play capability that permitted the Irish to average 30 yards per catch in the Fiesta Bowl victory. The talent-laden running back spots more than carried their weight, and unsung quarterback Tony Rice's competitive instincts and upgraded passing skills earned him his stripes, especially in matchups against Miami's Steve Walsh, USC's Rodney Pete, and West Virginia's Major Harris. For all those involved in Notre Dame's storybook 12-0 season, there was a time crystallized in their memory of the moment the Irish of 88 took on that special glow. For Lou Holtz, that feeling came on a balmy late summer Monday afternoon on the Irish practice fields. There's one day that I think really stands out in my mind where I felt we had a chance to be a good football team was August 29th. Because it was on August 29th where we went out and we had a very, very long, rigorous practice. I walked off that field completely convinced that the player's attitude was, hey, we aren't going to question anything you ask us to do. All we want you to do is tell us and show us how to win. That's all we want to do. So from that point on, I felt that if we didn't have a real good season, it was because we didn't lead them in the right direction. Because one thing was obvious, they wanted to win. Notre Dame's season opener against the Michigan team ranked number one by the Sporting News lent an air of electricity to the primetime matchup in Notre Dame Stadium. Although Irish fans wondered about the experience level of a team featuring 10 first-time starters, Coach Lou Holtz had no intention of compromising the goals of his third Notre Dame team. We want to be the best team in the country, and that's going to be the standard, and we're going to work to achieve that. And don't expect, well, because we got some problems, that we shouldn't be expected to win.
If replacing Heisman Trophy winner Tim Brown Mark Holtz's his most visible challenge, then sophomore Ricky Waters wasted little time filling the bill. Back to the 19, cut to the left, get to the 20, 25, he's at the 30, 35, to the 40, he's a block, that's the 50, he's going to go all the way, to the 30, to the 20, to the 10, touchdown Notre Dame, 81 yards. Much of Notre Dame's early success in 1988 would depend on the progress of a defensive unit that impressively blended a nucleus of veterans with three new starters on the defensive line. Led by junior linebacker Michael Stonebreaker and his 16 tackles, the Irish stymied Michigan's heralded ground game in the early going. Coming into the season, Notre Dame's rushing attack had been rated tops in the country by the Sporting News. With five new offensive line starters paving the way, sophomore Tony Brooks and junior Anthony Johnson helped the Irish rush for 141 yards of their own in the first half. Yet another newcomer, first-year place kicker Reggie Ho, had an immediate impact by kicking a pair of first-half field goals. Notre Dame's early 13-0 advantage gave Lou Holtz a little chance to relax as the eventual Big Ten and Rose Bowl champions poised for their inevitable comeback. Beginning with a one-yard plunge by Leroy Horde and finishing with a 49-yard field goal, Michigan staked its claim to a one-point lead with just over five minutes left in the game. Junior quarterback Tony Rice quickly moved the Irish downfield. First on a 21-yard first down scamper. Next on an 18-yard throw to sophomore tailback Tony Brooks. And finally on a Rice option play that gained four more yards. The Irish had driven 71 yards to the Michigan 9, setting the stage for heroics by Ho, as the diminutive walk-on prepared for a record-tying fourth field goal. I was aware that it was an important kick, you know, like every kicker, uh, but the, the thought of it being a uh, last, last uh, minute field goal that could win the game, uh, I, I just uh, blocked that out of my mind and, and concentrated on what I had to do. With a little over a minute remaining, the capacity crowd rose to its collective feet as Ho prepared for his 26-yard attempt. Pete Graham is the holder. He'll spot the ball down at the 16. Here it comes. The ball game on the line. Spot down. Kick is up, and it is good. And the Irish take the lead on field goal number four by Reggie Ho. But Notre Dame's celebration would have to wait. Michigan marched to the Irish 32 for a last-ditch field goal try on the game's final play. The 48-yard kick. That's Mark Farside. Here's the snap. The stop down. The kick is up in the air. It's got a chance, and it is no good. It went off to the right. And the Irish dodged the bullet, and they win it by a score of 19 to 17. For the second straight year, a victory over the always tough Wolverines proved to be a confidence-building debut for the 13th-ranked Irish. I think we came out and we proved to a lot of people in the country that uh, Notre Dame is going to play people tough. I think it gave a lot of confidence to our young defensive line, our young offensive line, and proved that they can play against a major college football team and we can win with them. I think the Michigan game was a very significant win because they had an outstanding football team. Had the best offensive line in the country, according to Sporting News, and great running backs, and an outstanding defense. It was a very, very good Michigan team. Why I think that game was very, very special was I'd talked to our squad in preseason about we were going to be a team and had a lot of good things happen to us. That this would be a team, and if they believed in the spirit of Notre Dame and played with that true spirit, that there would just be some strange things happen during the course of the year that we could not explain why or how. But if we believe, good things had happened. Never before a winner in Spartan Stadium, Lou Holtz took his Irish on the road for the first time in 88 versus defending Big Ten champ Michigan State. 
On this day, the Spartans would suffocate under the smoldering Notre Dame defense. Slow to start themselves, the Irish got a special team spark from rookie Ragib Ismail. I know it hit my hand and I didn't know if I really blocked it or not until I saw it squirming on the ground and I saw Mike Stonebreaker trying to go after it and a couple other guys and then at that time I felt, well, we did our job and uh, we got what we wanted to accomplish. Ismail's block set up a 22-yard Reggie Ho field goal that gave the Irish a 6-3 halftime lead. Notre Dame's offense took command on its initial second half possession. With Mark Green gaining a season high 125 yards and the versatile Tony Brooks switching gamely to fullback despite a stress fracture in his foot, the Irish drove 71 yards in six plays. Price capped the scoring drive by sprinting nine yards against the grain for a 10 point Notre Dame advantage. Notre Dame's defense snuffed out any hope of a Spartan comeback, and Michael Stonebreaker added the finishing touch. Bobby McAllister winning the snap, drops back, sets up, looks, 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 fires the pass over the middle, intercepts it. It's Stonebreaker, 30, 25, 20, down to the 15, down to the 10, down to the 5, touchdown Irish, Mike Stonebreaker. The Irish limited Michigan State to 89 rushing yards while gaining 195 on the ground in the second half alone against the Spartan defense that ranked number one versus the rush in 1987. Notre Dame's 20-3 victory brought a smile to Lou Holt's face as the Irish knocked off both Michigan and Michigan State for the second straight year. Without missing a beat, the Irish offense exploded the following week against Purdue. Ten slot to the left. Here's Rice on the option. Rice cuts in, down to the 35, down to the 30, 45, 20, you go all the way, down to the 10, 5, touchdown Notre Dame. Tony Rice's 38-yard scoring dash marked the first of six first-half touchdowns for Notre Dame. But it was Rice's arm that tickled the fancy of Notre Dame fans after he had completed just five of 21 passes in the first two games. Freshman Derek Brown's first collegiate reception was good for six points. Not to be outdone. First-year split end Ragib Ismail also scored on his first catch, a 54-yard bomb as the Irish offense appeared unstoppable. Here's that reverse pivot. They may go long to Ismail. Here's a long pass by Tony right down to Ismail. At the 10 five. Even backup quarterback Steve Bellis got into the act, tossing to Tony Brooks for 34 yards to complete the first half scoring as the Irish stormed to a 42 to nothing lead. Notre Dame's defense quietly did its part to stifle the Boilermakers, intercepting five Purdue passes, including two by senior safety George Streeter. Irish faithful were rewarded with a convincing 52-7 triumph. Ricky Waters' second putt return for a touchdown in three games. This one good for 66 yards, helped give the Irish a clean sweep over its trio of Big Ten foes. Analyzing those three triumphs proved a pleasant task for Lou Holtz, who clearly emphasized the bottom line. 
I think that we've made an awful lot of progress in a short period of time here at Notre Dame because a lot of people write in and, and they complain about the way we win now. We're not throwing the ball enough. We're not doing this. And I said, boy, that's really encouraging because before they used to complain about the fact that we weren't winning. So uh, as long as we can continue to win, we, we don't care whether we win pretty or anything else. All we want to do is win. And like Al Davis says, uh, just win. Notre Dame's first matchup with Stanford in 24 years was punctuated by a Tony Rice touchdown run on the very first possession. Rice is going to keep it on the outside, 25, Rice the pass, on the outside, 20, 15, he's down to the 10, 5, he'll score a touchdown! For the second straight week, Notre Dame's offense rolled high numbers early. The Irish stormed to a 21 to nothing lead in the first 20 minutes. With the potent backfield of Tony Rice, Mark Green, Tony Brooks, and Anthony Johnson all scoring in the first half. More of the same awaited the Cardinal defense after intermission. A 16-yard game by elusive flanker Ricky Waters on the first play of the second half continued the offensive onslaught. On his way to 107 rushing yards and a record-tying 10 straight completions, Rice finished the 73-yard parade with a three-yard pass to Derek Brown. The freshman tight end's second catch of the year, like his first, also gave the Irish six points. Once again, the Irish defense carried the day, as Stanford earned only one first down in its first five possessions. The next week at Pittsburgh, the Irish faced a seven-point deficit for the only time all season. But Notre Dame quickly answered the 7-0 Panther lead with a 60-yard four-play drive. Tony Brooks's 52-yard gallop, his longest of the year, preceded a two-yard sneak by Tony Rice. The Irish, who made a habit of answering the challenge of opponent scores all year long, promptly marched 86 yards on the next possession to take the lead. Anthony Johnson finished the work by scoring from a yard out. Tackle Jeff Alm and the Notre Dame defense held tight to the seven-point advantage. But pit turnovers played a major role, whether forced by the physical play of cornerback Todd Light. or gathered in by opportunistic corner Stan Smigala. High tandem on first and goal to go. Play action fakes to Crossman. Here's the quarterback, Dickerson down to the five, fumbled the ball in the end zone, picked it up, lost the ball, get it again, lost the ball, Notre Dame is rolling on it. It'll be a touchback, and the ball will go over to the Irish at the 20-yard line. No one played more of a part than junior fullback Braxton Banks, who hadn't been expected to play because of a knee injury. A crucial 30-yard reception helped set up his one-yard scoring dive that broke his 17-17 tie late in the third period. After a pit field goal, Notre Dame's clinching drive lasted nearly seven minutes and was highlighted by a ground attack that accounted for all 64 yards on the 14-play possession.
Second down, goal to go from the nine. Again, the eye attendant. Give to Mark Green. Green on the draw. Green down to the five. Green down to the two. Green touchdown! What a great run by Mark Green! Notre Dame's pass coverage threw a blanket over Pitt's receivers throughout the second half as Darnell Dickerson was held to three completions for 29 yards after the break. Rookie Arnold Alley sealed the verdict with three minutes left in the game as the 30-20 Irish victory set the stage for a classic showdown between 5-0 Notre Dame and top-ranked Miami. The one thing about Notre Dame, we have a history arising to this occasion. We have a history and a tradition of playing exceptionally well when people really don't expect that to happen. On a perfect 70-degree Saturday in South Bend, this game would be one that would more than live up to its advance billing. A first period pickoff by senior Duan Francisco and an emotional Chris Zorich stop sent a message to the visiting Hurricanes. But it was a forced fumble on the very first Miami possession that enabled veteran end Frank Stams to let Steve Walsh have a hint of the harassment he would face. Early in the game, I created a fumble. I think that set the tone for the rest of the game. I think they had went on to have six turnovers in the game. And I think that sort of set the tempo for our defense and uh, gave our offense good field position. The Irish struck hard and swiftly with a 22-yard completion to Ragib Ismail and a barreling 13-yard gain by Braxton Banks doing most of the damage. Quarterback Tony Rice did the rest. Again the double tight end, again the wishbone, just about 11 men up on the line of scrimmage. Here's Rice, five yards, to the goal line, and a touchdown. Tony Rice picked the ball to the fullback, circled to the right, hit the spot at the five-yard line, and nobody touched him, and burst into the end zone. The Irish throw 75 yards, in 12 plays, and they take the lead, 6 nothing. Much of the pregame quarterback conversation revolved around Walsh, but Rice let it be known that Walsh wasn't the only passer in the stadium. After Miami even the score at seven, Rice began an 80-yard drive with a 57-yard pass to Ismail and ended it with a nine-yard pass to wide open Banks to make it 14 to seven. Not to be outdone, Notre Dame's defense got into the scoring column four plays later as junior safety Pat Terrell shocked the Hurricane offense. We had a great rush by um, the whole defensive line including Frank Stams and uh, Frank happened to get a tip or a hand on the ball and it was up there and I took it and I raced down the sidelines and I knew I had to get in the end zone. I couldn't let Steve Walsh catch me. Notre Dame's two touchdown advantage left Jimmy Johnson perplexed, but not for long. Walsh even the score with a pair of touchdown passes in the last three minutes. The first on a fourth down and four call. The second capping a 54-yard Miami drive. But the artistry of the Hurricanes signal caller couldn't diminish the spirit of the Irish defenders. We were up 21-7, you know, it was a couple minutes ago to half, and all of a sudden, bam, bam, and you know, it was tied. And I think that woke us up a little bit and, 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 and made us see that we had to play that much harder in the second half. We decided in the secondary and on the defense that uh, no matter what happened, no matter how many yards they got, no matter how many uh, passes they completed, they wouldn't score enough touchdowns to beat us. Notre Dame's defense made good on its promises as Jeff Alm forced a turnover on Miami's very first play after the half. One possession later, after Steve Bellis halted the Hurricanes on a fake punt attempt, Rice struck again with deadly precision. This time on a first down 44-yard strike to Ricky Waters. The Irish made it 28-21 on the very next play. 
Double tight end, wishbone backfield. Tony Rice will take the snap, gives it to Eilers. Eilers is down to about the two touchdown. Pat Eilers for a score. A Reggie Ho field goal put Notre Dame up by 10 after three periods. Then Walsh went to work again. But the Irish forced a sixth turnover, this time on a hit at the one by George Streeter and a recovery by Stonebreaker. Miami came knocking at the door again on its next possession, but Stams canceled the threat himself. Miami was, you know, the number one team and, uh, you know, for me personally, Steve Walsh had not been sacked uh, the whole year, so I knew that was a heck of a challenge for myself. The Hurricanes mounted a final attack, but the Irish stood their ground. First Streeter and then West Pritchett denied Miami's access to the end zone, forcing Walsh into a fourth and seven situation. On a final desperate attempt, the Hurricanes quarterback lofted a throw in the corner of the end zone to Andre Brown. It was only fitting that the game of the year would come down to a two-point conversion attempt in the final seconds. All week we, we knew that the, the game would come down to a play like this, so the feeling was actually relaxed and everyone knew what they had to do. And um, I think since we were confident, that's why we did come out you know, like we did. And um, everyone had their man locked down really good. And um, personally, I had a feeling he was coming to my man and um, made the play. The capacity crowd held its breath as the Irish defended their end zone one last time. The wing man on the right side, three wide receivers right. They're going to go for two. Back to throw. Walsh looks, looks, looks. Has the time. Lost the ball. The pass is batted down. It's batted down by Terrell. And the Irish may win it this afternoon. They're out in front 31-30 as Jimmy Johnson went for two. People had their minds set on Miami, and every play of the game was like the last play of their career. And uh, the emotion in the stadium, the emotion on the sidelines, and the camaraderie on the sidelines, you know, I'll never forget that. Uh, that. That's a thrill for me. Ironically, the night before the game, Lou Holtz had uncharacteristically promised an Irish victory. Well, when we were in the locker room after the Pittsburgh when I said to the football team that we could beat the University of Miami, but there would be certain things that have to happen. Number one, they would have to believe in the spirit of Notre Dame. Number two, they'd have to believe in each other. Number three, they'd have to believe in the coaches. I was hoping to have a very, very positive week's practice. However, we lost both starting offensive guards against Pittsburgh, had to move two tackles in, and we couldn't have the type of week that I really expected. It wasn't very upbeat, it wasn't very positive, there was too much negative coaching out of necessity because of position switches, etc. So as I went to the pep rally and I stood up there, I just didn't feel real good and yet I felt we were capable of winning. And I've never predicted we're going to do anything in my entire life. And I said that I felt we were going to win and I said, and you go tell them I said so. I didn't feel that was going to fire Miami up because they didn't believe there was any way they could lose anyway. That they're always so very, very confident, which is always good in a football team. But I do think it helped our football team come to the realization that, hey, Coach Holtz does believe in it. But I also did not think that would make the news because I thought it was past the deadline. And when I got up the next morning and read that in the headlines, I thought, I did what? And Fortunately, our football team went out and backed that up. But once again, I think it all starts with a faith and a belief. It was a season in the sun for Notre Dame in 1988. It was a time for emotion, a time for intensity, a time for memories.
second-ranked Irish had to shift gears quickly a week later, as the passing slants of Miami gave way to the wishbone wizardry of Air Force. Yet Notre Dame's ground game was a match for the Falcons, as the Irish proved early on a 71-yard drive that featured 11 straight running plays. Quarterback Tony Rice tried only two passes on Notre Dame's second scoring excursion, but his completions to Ricky Waters for 22 yards and Derek Brown for 10 proved to be big gainers during the following Irish possession. Rice concluded this 73-yard drive himself with a four-yard round. Later, a third Notre Dame scoring march began with a scintillating 36-yard punt return by Waters, who finished the year ranked fourth nationally in that category. Brooks took a Kent Graham pitch for 27 yards down the left sideline. And Anthony Johnson's tackle breaking power gave the Irish a 20 to 6 advantage. Notre Dame's defense made the necessary adjustments to the wishbone, but not without a diligent week of preparation. When you play an opposite team, that's the worst kind of team for, for the secondary, because that involves us in a lot of uh, run support. Plus, we have to be alert enough to uh, watch the play fake. Streeter and Todd Light proved just alert enough to put the clamps on a Falcon offense that led the nation with its 432 average rushing yards. Their handiwork helped put Holtz, Rice, and the Irish offense in an enviable position. Out of a 20 to 13 halftime lead, Brooks put the icing on an 81 yard march that ended with this 42 yard player pass from Rice. Versatile Steve Bellis gained his share of Notre Dame's 267 rushing yards. And he also fooled the Falcons with this scoring pitch from midfield. They're coming on the blitz, the toss to Bellis. Bellis, a quarterback in the game, throwing long down to Ricky Waters, looking in the air, got the ball at the five, he's at the three, at the two, touchdown Irish! Meanwhile, the top-ranked Air Force ground forces managed just 29 second-half rushing yards in the 41-13 Irish victory. Unbeaten Notre Dame's trip to venerable Memorial Stadium in Baltimore to face Navy didn't produce a particularly stellar all-around effort by the Irish. But Lou Holtz's physical defense again did a more than credible job of shutting down a dangerous wishbone attack. Mark Green got Notre Dame's offense clicking on all cylinders with three straight carries for 30 yards. And rookie Rodney Culver broke a handful of tackles on his way to the end zone. Green eluded the middies for seven of his 45 yards, while Anthony Johnson made a nifty one-handed grab for 19 more. That enabled Reggie Ho to boot a 29-yard field goal for the Irish at the halftime gun, ending a 50-yard drive. Johnson began the second half with this 13-yard gainer, then Brooks's second effort pounding pushed the Irish deeper into enemy territory.
twice accounted for 18 of his team high 88 yards in reaching the two. From there, sophomore Ryan Mahalko bulldozes his way for Notre Dame's final points of the afternoon. The Irish defense limited Navy to only 192 total yards. And Notre Dame's eighth success of the season was good enough to push the Irish to number one following UCLA's loss to Washington State. I've never put a lot of stock in being number one because I hadn't been there before. And then to play very poorly and beat Navy and be elevated to number one because another team lost, I didn't think meant that you're a great football team. But it's very difficult to remain number one. And one of the reasons is because people feel that they have to perform like a number one team, and yet nobody can tell me what a number one team is. Everybody feels they've got to score two touchdowns on one play, or nobody should make a yard against you. So when you really sit down and analyze it, being number one wasn't any different. Touchdown only counted six points, not eight. You had to make ten yards, not nine for a first down. And if you fumbled and they recovered, you didn't get it back. Also, when you look into it, you find out there isn't any advantage at all to being number one, and it's strictly mental. So all we said to the football squad is if they were right, they wouldn't have to vote every week. I wasn't any different, and I wasn't Barry Switzer. They weren't looking at a football coach that's used to being number one each and every week. But let's just make sure we're the best football team in the stadium on Saturday. Notre Dame brought that number one ranking into its own stadium for the first time since 1970. Yet a Rice team featuring the nation's longest losing streak loomed dangerously following the Owls' near upset of Arkansas the previous week. Visitors impressively rolled 70 yards for an early field goal before Ragib Ismail took matters into his own hands. And let's see, will Johnson take it? Ismail says, no, I will. At the 13, 50, 20, 25, 30, look out. At the 40, he's the man to beat. He's going to go all the way. He's down to the 40. He's at the 30. He can run to the 20, walk at the 10, and dance in for a touchdown. Ismail's in early salvo marked the first Notre Dame score in an effort that befitted the number one ranked team. Mark Green exploded for 40 yards to the Rice 8. Then short yardage specialist Anthony Johnson followed that up with the first of his two consecutive touchdown runs. Six foot seven inch defensive tackle Jeff Owl made life miserable for Owl quarterback Quintus Roper by picking this pass attempt out of midair. Tony Brooks then optioned his way to the one and negotiated the last yard for a 28 to three lead. Irish rushers continued to batter away in the second half, with Brooks and Rodney Culver pulverizing the Owls for chunks of the 294 Irish ground yards. Now forced to throw the football, Rice moved as far as the Notre Dame 16, until a Chris Zorich sack pushed the Owls out of field goal range. Plus, Pritchett meted out the same sort of treatment to Roper on third and goal. Another Rice field goal did nothing more than give the Rocket another chance to blast off. It was kind of a little squib kick, and I can remember before we went on to the field, Coach Oates telling everyone on the team that no matter how they kicked it, he wanted me to handle the ball. And it was just a situation where everyone was again blocked, 
and no one really was in position to make a tackle on me. And I saw a hole off to my left, I believe, and I just tried to get to it as fast as I could, and the whole sideline was cleared. And I tried to run as fast as I could to reach the end zone. At the 10, he is going touchdown. Ismail's two scoring run backs in a game tied an NCAA record. Yet the Irish weren't finished yet. Joe Giroux notched the last of the seven Notre Dame touchdowns as the Irish more than justified their lofty standing. Coming off an open date, Notre Dame was primed to finish unbeaten at home for the second straight season. But the Irish would have to do it against the Penn State team that the seniors had never beaten. It would be an emotional final home appearance for the Notre Dame veterans. Well, the senior leadership could never be minimized. I've said over and over that whenever you find a good football team, you find the seniors playing the best football of their career. And I think it was certainly true of this year's class. But they assured me that we would be the most disciplined, dedicated group of seniors that's ever been at Notre Dame, that they were going to provide Notre Dame leadership, and this they really and truly did. The Irish promptly tipped Penn State quarterback Lance Lonergan to the fact that it would be a topsy-turvy afternoon for the Nittany Lions. Yards wouldn't come easily via any route, as senior Corny Southall let the visitors know as they tried to avoid their first losing season in 50 years. Notre Dame's first possession opened at its own 13, but a 16-yard burst by Braxton Banks on second down proved just the start of a 502-yard day for the home team. Mark Green's 22-yard sideline scamper capped a 60-yard drive midway through the second period as the Irish battled their way to 301 rushing yards. Early in the third quarter, Notre Dame would make it a 21-3 Irish advantage when Tony Rice and Ragib Ismail would connect on a 67-yard touchdown, the longest completion in Rice's career. Try as they might, the Nittany Lions simply could not find their way to the Notre Dame end zone. George Streeter nearly picked off this Penn State pass, And senior Steve Roddy ended the last Nittany Lion try with an interception forced by Frank Stams. With a Fiesta Bowl bid in hand, it was time for the Irish to turn their sights to unbeaten and second-ranked USC. Southern Cal was very, very important. But as we talked to the squad, we said, after the Michigan game, that was really a big game. But the next game's bigger because we won the last one. And I said, as long as you keep winning, the next game becomes even bigger. I think what was important for the Southern Cal game was to put it in a proper perspective. It wasn't bigger in life, and it wasn't any more important than a Navy game or any other football game we played during the course of the season. It was for a championship. And what a championship performance it would be for Irish quarterback Tony Rice, as he found himself matched up against USC's Heisman candidate Rodney Pete. It was number one versus number two for the 24th time in college football history. Lou Holtz and Larry Smith each brought perfect 10-0 records into the regular season finale for the first time in the storied 60-year series history. Sixty minutes later, there would be no question who was number one and who was number two. Pinned at his own two, Rice shocked the record 94,000 spectators 
by going for broke on Notre Dame's first play from scrimmage. Just minutes later, Notre Dame's junior signal caller made the next of a series of Irish big plays. Rice on the option, carrying for the first time to the 40, to the 45, down the sideline, at the 40, at the 30, at the 20. He could go all the way to 10 to 5. Touchdown, Irish! 65-yard run down the left side by Tony Rice, and he outlegged the entire Southern Cal defense. Rice's ninth rushing touchdown marked a high point in the season in which he led Notre Dame in rushing, becoming the first Irish quarterback to do so since Paul Horning's Heisman season in 1956. The first of four USC turnovers in the first half came when Frank Stams recovered a fumble knocked loose by George Williams. Stams' second recovery of the year was turned into six points by Mark Green just five plays later. The 14 to nothing fighting Irish advantage was one they would never lose. Notre Dame's defense disrupted the Trojans all day long, as George Williams and Jeff Alm combined on yet another USC turnover. A 66-yard Trojan drive cut the Irish lead in half, but that would be the only touchdown of the afternoon for USC and Rodney Pete. We knew Rodney Pete was a good quarterback. We knew he could do a lot of things. We knew he could scramble and we knew he could throw. So. Uh, our game plan was to put pressure on him, make him throw the bad ball, make him throw it earlier than he wanted to. Uh, and that's what we did. We, we blitzed a lot, and uh, we came from the outside a little bit more. And uh, we were successful, and uh, things turned out good. While Stams put the heat on Pete for three sacks, it was cornerback Stan Smagala who struck one of the most decisive Irish blows. Rodney Pete with a slot right in the wide out left, throws the ball right over the middle, the pass is intercepted, picked off by the Irish, it's Magala, Magala to the 30, to the 20, he down to the 10, the 5, a touchdown, Then Magala picks off Rodney Pete and returns it for a score. Magala's first interception of the year netted six points for Notre Dame and wrested the momentum away from the Trojans. In the second half, USC tried to make it close, but the Irish defense was equal to the task. Twice they turned back the Trojans from inside the Notre Dame four. USC settled for a field goal, and Notre Dame's offensive line of Andy Heck, Dean Brown, Tim Ryan, Tim Grunhard, and Mike Helt took command of the victory clinching drive. Despite a sore ankle, fullback Anthony Johnson did his part to put the game out of reach. He broke the Trojans back with a critical 23-yard gain on third down on the screen right. When native Californian Mark Green dove the final yard, it was all over but the shouting. A convincing road victory gave the Irish six straight wins over the longtime rival Trojans. With only West Virginia left on the agenda, Notre Dame had finished its first perfect regular season since 1973. For the Irish, just one more obstacle remained in the quest for college football's top prize. We've come a long way since my freshman year, but I also realized that uh, you know, we had one more game left, and that was West Virginia. And uh, I'm just happy to be here right now and to be part of this. With the battle for the national crown on the horizon, the Notre Dame squad regrouped in Phoenix the day after Christmas. 
The Irish went back to basics in hopes of shaking off the rust and regaining their touch after a five-week layoff. The scene was Sun Devil Stadium, as Notre Dame brought the number one ranking into a postseason bowl game for the first time. The Irish faced the most successful West Virginia team in history, but Lou Holtz tried to understate the magnitude of the contest. We weren't playing for a national championship once again. That, that's too big of a burden. You just go out and you play to the very best of your ability, and when you get done, let's evaluate where we are and go from there. With an early Billy Hackett field goal, the Irish quickly picked up where they had left off at USC. Dominating the line of scrimmage, Notre Dame's diversified running game continually kept the Mountaineers off balance. Anthony Johnson climaxed the possession with a fourth down surge for six. For a touchdown. Double tight end. Weiss hands off to Anthony Johnson. Touchdown. Anthony Johnson goes in for a score. And it is now 9 0 as the Irish go 61 yards in 10 plays. The Irish were in control after one period, but the best was yet to come. With West Virginia geared to stop the run, Tony Rice's play action passing produced the most profitable throwing day of his career. Tight end Derek Brown's second reception of the afternoon left Notre Dame knocking at the door. The diversity and extent of the Irish arsenal was apparent as another freshman, number five, Rodney Culver, scored to make it 16 to nothing. quickly gained Notre Dame advantage stunned the Mountaineers who had never trailed all season long. Major Harris gamely tried to mount a comeback, but Frank Stams and his mates had other ideas. Notre Dame's philosophy of making West Virginia pay the price paid dividends of its own. Price's aerial talents continued to baffle the Mountaineer defense. First, Anthony Johnson. Then Ragib Ismail found chinks in the West Virginia secondary. Notre Dame's lead, a commanding one at 23 to three, was in part a tribute to the impact of Notre Dame's junior quarterback. I know when I'm in the huddle, and seeing Tony across from me kind of lifts me up, and it makes me want to you know, put out even more because he's such a great guy and such a leader in the field at all times. Despite a 17-point halftime bulge, Irish defensive coordinator Barry Alvarez knew the Mountaineers would come back with guns blazing. But Pat Terrell quieted the West Virginia faithful with an interception early in the third period. Two plays later, Rice struck again, this time on a sideline route to Mark Green. That set up a 32-yard Reggie Ho field goal that made it 26-6. Down, but not out, the Mountaineers made their most impressive surge of the day. Major Harris touchdown pass and an interception throw by Rice put the pressure squarely on the Notre Dame defense. As they had all year long, the Irish defenders responded. 
On first down from the Notre Dame 26, Harris is hemmed in for a loss of two. On second down, Stan Smagala makes a touchdown saving deflection. On third down, Frank Stams and Arnold Alley push the Mountaineers out of field goal range. Three plays netted minus 14 yards as frustrated West Virginia could not crack the staunch Irish defense. A downcast Harris gave way to Rice, who converted a key third down on the fourth period's first play. The very next play saw Rice go deep to Ricky Waters for a 57-yard gain that set the Irish up at the West Virginia Five. I can him, Ricky Waters flank to the right. Fake with a fullback, lob pass in the end zone, touchdown, Frank Jacobs. Jacobs' first career touchdown put a final nail on the West Virginia coffin and gave Lou Holtz a feeling it was a national championship kind of day. Now leading 34 to 13 after Rice's two-point conversion, it was left for the Notre Dame defense to secure the victory. Don Nalen's proud squad put one more score on the board. But it wasn't enough against a defense that knew Harris's options were limited. The Irish contained Harris with only 11 net rushing yards. And the Notre Dame secondary did the rest. As the seconds ticked down in the 34 to 21 triumph, elation reigned on the Notre Dame sideline as the thought of a national championship began to sink in. For the first time since 1977, and for the 11th time in history, Notre Dame moved atop the college football world again. It hadn't been an easy road for a youthful Irish team that many experts thought was a year away from greatness. But Lou Holtz's fundamental week-by-week -week approach kept each Notre Dame achievement in perspective yet never let the Irish lose sight of their ultimate goal. From the last second victory in the opener against Michigan, through spirited triumphs over Miami, USC, and West Virginia, the Irish did whatever it took to win. Head coach Lou Holtz had no question how his team would be remembered. I think there are certain things that will really stand out on this squad as history records their achievements. Number one, they achieved it when nobody, and I mean nobody in the country, thought that they could do it. Number two, they did it against one of the most difficult schedules that Notre Dame's ever played. Out of the top six teams in the country other than Notre Dame, I believe we defeated four of those top six teams. But I think the other thing that'll probably stand out was it was a very young football team. A good senior leadership, but basically a young football team. But most important of all was a football team that liked one another and played with the real true spirit of Notre Dame. When you talk about the spirit of Notre Dame, this football team believed in it and they played for it. 